So once again, welcome on week three of Forgotten God, a message series on the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, uh, Holy Ghost, spooky, right? Talking about the Spirit of God, oftentimes we do not hear much about the Holy Spirit of God, this third person of the Holy Spirit. We talk about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and it's... Um, Oftentimes, either misunderstood, uh, people are afraid, this whole Holy Spirit deal and business, you know, it just, uh, you know, let's just go to the church and keep it clean. But that's exactly what the enemy wants, because you see, the third person of the Trinity is a person. And we talked about the personhood of the, you know, of the Holy Spirit. We talked that he is the one that uh, as a comforter, the one who comes along to um, enable us to live this life, uh, this, life this Christian life. Uh, the one who comes and convicts us. Uh, right? We said that true friends, we talked that he's a true friend, right? My closest friend, an intimate friend. And true friends tell us what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. True friends tell us what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. How many of you want to go to the doctor? Not that the doctor is a true friend or a close friend. Pastor Bobby is a true friend and is a close friend because, you know. But how many of you go to the doctor and you wish them to lie to you. I mean, some of us, we do wish. Like, listen, doctor, I'm not up for that kind of news right now, right? But no, you want to hear the truth. You want to know what's going on. See, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. He says he comes to convict the world, not condemn. There is a difference between condemnation. Condemnation is the work of our own you know, not giving into the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know, when the Holy Spirit says, hey, Christy, um, do not uh, put up your middle finger when that guy cuts you on the highway. No, I don't do that, I promise, and neither do you. But that is conviction. When you're, uh, you're tempted to go to the left or to the right, and the Holy Spirit says, hey, hey, warning sign, pay attention. What are you doing? You're getting off, uh, off track. Pay attention, right? The Holy Spirit convicts, but the Holy Spirit will not enforce. He's not going to overwrite your men mental uh, faculties, your reason, you know, your willpower. The Holy Spirit will just bring the knowledge of truth and allow us to make a decision on it. He is not going to force. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not, po uh, pos uh, you know, there is a difference between being filled with the Holy Spirit and possessed by demons. See, demon possession overrides the mental faculties, the reason, and the will of a person. Uh, people that act in ways that when they come to it, they wonder what happened and where are they? See, it's not so with the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, first of all, God created us in his image and he, he created you as a free entity with a free will to make a choice. You're not a machine and you're not a robot. The Holy Spirit of God is going to come and bring the knowledge of the truth and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? But it's going to allow you to make a choice for Him or against Him. A choice to walk in righteousness and holiness in truth and justice or you're going to walk in your ways. That's the Holy Spirit. He's going to come and reside with you. You know, we are the Paul writes and Corinthians says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, we, we carry the presence of God if you will, everywhere you go. And he's there to convict. He's there to instruct. He's there to comfort. He's there to provide strength to, you, to us on the, on the journey. So he wants to be a close, uh, intimate, best friend. He wants to have a relationship with you. Second Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 14, in the message, paraphrase, the, Paul says in closing the letter, or uh, this chapter says, the, the amazing grace of the master, Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The intimate friendship. He wants to be an intimate friend. And the enemy wants to scare you because uh, this Holy Spirit is going to come and going to make you look all weird. We said in the past two weeks that people are weird. The Holy Spirit is not weird. Pe people act foolishly and carnally and weird, but the Holy Spirit is not weird. So we, 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 we equate behavior to the person of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about too, we make it so much about the gifts of the Spirit, and I'll talk more tonight, because uh, rather this morning, th what we're talking about this morning, my title's message is Gifts from a Friend. So we make it so much about the gifts, and we leave out the person. 
Remember, the gifts are about the person of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit that points us to the person of Jesus. It bears witness and, you know, reflects, and def reflects all to Jesus. And I, talk, I want to talk to you in the beginning about three particular gifts. We have three particular gifts. And the first gift today, you know, I want, as we talk about spiritual gifts, um, and this is another area of confusion, of course, as we talk about spiritual gifts. And there are three that, as we find mentioned in Scripture. And the first is eternal life. The first gift we receive from God is eternal life. As a, re as a result of confession of faith, as a result of surrendering our life to Jesus, we receive eternal life. That's the first gift. Eternal life. And it's the ultimate gift. Listen, if this is all I get on this side of eternity, awesome. Glory to God in the highest. That's all you need to get to heaven. But there's some good promises and there's some provision that God has made through the Holy Spirit to aid us in this uh, life. To live the Christian life victoriously. You will not, as Jesus promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'll be with you until the end of the ages. So you have a very intimate, close friend that wants to be with you and he wants to give you some gifts. But too often again, we're afraid because you, you think you've seen stuff on TV and you've seen stuff on, on places and you think, man, if I'm a spirit filled Christian, if I have the Holy Spirit, I'm going to swing off of chandeliers. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to act crazy and be all like weird and I'm going to walk with a Bible uh, under my uh, uh, arms and I'm going to, you know, uh, be this like, uh, you know, judgmental, uh, finger pointing person and better than thou and, you know, so close to glory and so, you know, heavily minded. That you are no earthly good. And we make it so much about other stuff than what it should be. And it should be about the person of Jesus. Oh, the Holy Spirit bears witness and points us to the person of Jesus. To this major gift, eternal life. Which is the ultimate gift. Which was paid and bought by the blood of Jesus. Nothing else. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. The what? The gift of God. It's a gift of God. It's eternal life. Salvation is a gift of God. It is not, you know, it's not of our own doing. It's not our own working. We've done nothing to deserve it, to merit it. It's something that God just, you know, what is uh, grace? Unmerited favor. God giving us what we don't deserve and giving Jesus what we did deserve, right? On the cross. Jesus be on the cross, you know, and, you know, paying the, the, the penalty for your sin and my sin. So, right? So, that is, you know, undeserved favor. We receive grace. We receive forgiveness. We receive life at the expense of Jesus. Right? Jesus died, so we will not die eternally. So, the first gift is eternal life and is a gift. And this is the main thing. We in Christianity, we in the church, make it too often about so many other things. And we lose perspective that Jesus Christ came into the world to reconcile a broken, dead humanity to its creator, to its heavenly father. And Christianity is not about bad people becoming good people. But Christianity is about a spiritual dead people, far removed from the life of God, being brought to life. Ephesians chapter 2 says, but God being rich in mercy, because of his great love, made us alive together with Christ. He made us alive together with Christ. Why? God, because of his love, being rich in mercy towards you and me, made us alive together with Christ. So we all come alive in Christ. Our statue, we are we're dead, we are low. And Jesus comes, steps out of, you know, eternity, out of glory, takes upon humble human flesh, you know, equates, you know, you know, identifies with me and you, takes upon human flesh, humble, meek, so he can relate to you, so he can relate to me. And says, hey, I made a way. As you confess Jesus, as you trust in Jesus, you know, he, he reconciles us to God. Says that God was in Jesus reconciling the world to himself. So God is doing the work of reconciliation. Faithful reconciliation. Faithful is he who began the good work. Who began the good work in our life? You? No. He. God. To bring it to completion. His way. His, you know, his means. His strength. His gift. Eternal life. And this is the main thing. The Holy Spirit though is about here. You're not going to need the Holy Spirit when you're in heaven. You know that? 
The Holy Spirit was given to us here because we need it here. It's, he's a helper. He's the one that comes along. You need the Holy Spirit of God. I need the Holy Spirit of God. In fact, Paul says, at the moment of conversion, our first installment is a deposit, and that deposit from God is the Holy Spirit. So you have the Holy Spirit of God inside of you, and the moment you've confessed faith in Christ. The second gift is the Holy Spirit. So you have the first gift, primary, the eternal, eternal life. Second gift, the Holy Spirit. And this is separate from the gift of salvation. And listen, you do not need the Holy Spirit. You do not need to speak in tongues. You, don't need a, you do not need to be, and I'll make a caveat, you don't need to have a lot of stuff to be saved. Remember the thief on the cross? Jesus looks to him and says, Bud, today me and you, paradise, glory. Did the guy go to catechism? No. Was he spirit filled? Did he speak in tongues? Did he lay hands on anybody? Did he do anything? No. He just, you know what said? He knew that he, he deserved to hang on the cross. He knew that what he did was dark and evil and he was paying the, the price for what he did. Jesus didn't. And the other guy is like, man, you got powers, man. You got some goods. You got some gin in a bottle. Rub it the right way and get us off this cross, dude. What's up with you? You're the son of God. And if you're the son of God, get yourself off that cross and get us off this, this cross too, man. Let's escape together. The other guy, you know, man, time to fess up, time to pay for my dues, time to hang high. And I'm hanging high because I did wrong. This guy sitting in the middle did not deserve, he did good, he healed, he raised the dead, he fed the hungry, he gathered the destitute, he had compassion. What did he do to deserve to? But he was crucified for my transgression. He hung high for my sin. And your sin. So when we have the Holy Spirit that comes in and helps us live this life to bear witness of the grace of God. Now, you don't, as I said, we don't need the gifts of the Spirit to be saved. There are benefits of every gifts, you know, spiritual gifts, but they're not necessary. To salvation. The only thing you need for salvation is Jesus and Jesus alone. But, there are a big caveat and a big but here. You would be a fool not to desire spiritual gifts. You would be a fool not to desire to have everything that God has sent into the world to help you, to help us live this life. Jesus already paid for our sins. He's done. Our eternity is secure. You know what? And God has a work for us in this world. God has something for you to do here. And he says, I will give you my Holy Spirit. He will come upon you. He will empower you to be my witness. In other words, to preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit of God is inside of you, empowering you to preach the gospel. What is the gospel? Good news. Good news. You don't have to spend eternity in hell separated from God because Jesus paid the price for our sins. Surrender to Jesus. Embrace Jesus. Serve Jesus. And you'll spend eternity with him. Today you would be with me in paradise, right? Acts 1, 4 through 5. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promises. The gift. God the Father promises a gift which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And at Pentecost, 50 days after the ascension, right? The Holy Spirit of God descends upon and births the church, empowers the church. You want the Holy Spirit. You need some Holy Spirit power in the situation you find yourself with. You tried it in your own wisdom, you tried it in your own ways, and it's not working. You know why? Because it's not by might, not by power, but it's by the Spirit of God. There are some supernatural circumstances that, you, that, you, that you're confronting with, and you're looking for natural means to address what only the supernatural can fix. And that is our Father God, He's a, you know, he, he specializes in the supernatural. He transcends the natural order that we're confined to and bound to. And he desires to step into your circumstances and bring some supernatural power. 
out of the natural. The Holy Spirit gives us some benefits, gives us some gifts that, to help us to minister, to serve, to love, to love like God loves, to, loves like, to love like Jesus loved humanity. And it is a sad thing that oftentimes people receive salvation, but they shy away from the Holy Spirit and from the gifts of the Spirit because they're afraid. They have misconception. Again, you know, this Holy Spirit is going to make me look all cuckoo, you know, weird and whatnot. As I said, that is not the Holy Spirit. That is not the Spirit of God. So we have eternal life, the first gift, the Holy Spirit, the second gift. And we're talking now about spiritual gifts. And this is our topic for today. Romans 12, 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. I don't choose my gifts. You don't choose your gifts. The Holy Spirit, according to the grace given to us, we all have, uh, you know, certain different gifts. And uh, here the word is used, charis. That's the Greek word, you know, for grace. If you will, uh, literally means a grace gift. What is grace? Unmerited savor. Um, unmerited rather savor. Unmerited favor. So something you receive the gift that you do not deserve. You did not choose. It is the Holy Spirit. It's a grace gift. This is what literally means here. Charismatic literally means a gift of grace. You know, God wants you to be charismatic. Hold on, Pastor. What do you mean? I'm going to be one of those crazy Christians? You know, name it and claim it, you know, and all kind of crazy stuff, and I'm going to act like all weird. No. Meaning that God has given you a grace gift, and you're going to operate in your great gift. You're going to operate in that grace gift. And that grace gift can be anything. Generous giving, generous serving, you know, playing an instrument, preaching, teaching, holding a Bible study, you know, speaking in tongues, prophesying, why not? And we're going to talk about speaking in tongues because this, this one particular gift polarizes Christianity and Christian, uh, Christians a lot. We make it all about glossalia, uh, glossolalia, you know, or like, or like speaking in tongues. You know, there are so many other gifts, there are so many other benefits, but we get stuck oftentimes in just the speaking in tongues. Yeah, but you got to speak in tongues. And it's important. And Paul says, I wish that you would all speak in tongues. You know, I wish that all of you desire spiritual gifts. But speaking in tongues is something that you do in private, in your prayer time of devotion with God. It's not something that, you know, you just blurt out in public. And, you know, uh, as I gave an example last time, dacă vă vorbesc în românești, vă vorbesc în alte limbi și vă vorbesc despre toate lucrurile, vă iubesc, dar uh, nu mă înțelegeți și vă spun tot felul de lucruri, Exactly, right? He said, hey, man, hallelujah. Preach it, pastor. Hallelujah. Did he help you with anything? I said, ah, look at Pastor Christi. Shh. Speaking in tongues. He's special. He's so close to heaven. You know, he's unique. You know, I don't speak in tongues like him. He's got a, you know, a direct line with God. You know, he's, you know, he's cool. I'm not, you know. Huh? Paul says, I'd much rather speak one word publicly that edifies, that's understood, that makes sense. You know, so there is a place for speaking in tongues. You know, there's a, there's a place for, you know, for the gifts to manifest. And some people ask, hey, are we charismatic? I hope we are, but not in that crazy sense. You know, I do want to see every gift being used as God. The purpose that God gives you gifts, to use them. God wants you to use your gifts to serve, because why? Your gift blesses me, my gift blesses you. It's not for my, my gift is not for my advancement. Your gift is not for your advancement. Yeah, our gifts, we build each other up. We bless each other. And we need the, the gifts. We need these grace gifts to operate. And again, talking to, you know, to speaking in tongues, you know, we do, we do believe that God is a God of order. So in our public, you know, in our worship services, when we come public and corporate worship, you know, we, we say, hey, you know, I'm glad that you speak in tongues. And I do speak in tongues. I'm a tongue talker, you know, for those of you who know what I'm talking about. All right. But, you know, I don't want to make it about to the, to the speaking in tongues. I want to make it about Jesus because Jesus, Jesus is more important. Because so easy we can take this, we can take this air of, you know, super spirituality better than, oh yeah, you know, it's, uh, uh, no, we don't need that. I want anything in my life 
uh, to be a, rather a channel to Jesus, a sign point to Jesus. I don't want to take anything from Jesus because he hung on the cross. It is about him. He deserves the glory. He deserves the honor. He deserves the worship, not me. He does. I want us to operate in the charismatic. I want us to, to operate in the, these great grace gifts. But God at the same time, God is a God of order. Paul talked to this in, to the church at Corinth. Uh, they received the Holy Spirit, but they were a little bit out of control. You know what I'm saying? And Paul, the great apostle, had to step and say, hey guys, cut it out. Stop it. It's foolishness. You don't believe me? Let's turn to the Bible. You don't have to believe me. 1 Corinthians 12.1. Now about spiritual gifts, brother, I do not want you to be ignorant. As Paul says, hey, there are spiritual gifts. Do not be ignorant. Desire spiritual gifts. But be orderly as well. Be orderly. Be in order. And don't, 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 do not be puffed with pride. You know, I have this gift. I have the, you know. It is a gift. You've done nothing to deserve it. it was, it's a grace gift. It's given to you. Serve accordingly. You know, it's, uh, it's the same true today. You know, people, you know, are, are out of control. You've been, how many of you have been maybe in church services like, what is, just happened? What is going on? And you just want to get up and run. And here is an area where people are ignorant. You know, they ask, you know, questions. Are spiritual gifts for today? Of course they are here for today. You know, the Holy Spirit of God is here today and giving gifts and, you know, and, and enabling us to live this spiritual life. But we need to be orderly. You know, there's, there's a group of people in theology, in systematic theology, or, you know, that's, a, that's, that's the systematic, you know, inductive study of the Word of God, and uh, of the, which you call the Bible, right? And um, there is a wind of theology and teaching in Christianity called secessionist. That's a big word, I know. I mean, what a secessionist says is that the, the spiritual gifts and the supernatural stopped ceased with the, with the age of the apostles. There's, there's no more, you know, there's no more apostolic ministry. There's no more uh, move of the Holy Spirit. And I don't find anywhere in the Bible that that's the case. Because, you know, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will be with us until the end of the ages. So if the Holy Spirit is with us, he's going to give you some gifts. Because you know, as long as we're still alive, we still need to, you know, we're still uh, you know, in this world and we need his help. We need his gifts to help us live a victorious Christian life. To live above the circumstances, not underneath the circumstances. And what I mean, um, what I mean by that, it doesn't mean that you're not going to go through some trials, some testings, through some hard times. But your spirit is going to be above. You're not going to be overcome by your circumstances. You're going to experience joy. You're going to experience the presence of God in your life. You know, as you're going through, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me, God. Amen? So we're walking. And, of course, we're, you know, there are others that believe that spiritual gifts are for today. And that's what we believe. We believe it's biblical. But a lot of questions centered around the gift of tongues, speaking in tongues. Do you, yeah, I understand you received Jesus, you got saved, but do you speak in tongues? You got to speak in tongues. And it's like, hold up. You don't have to speak in no tongue to be sa saved. You should desire to speak in tongues. Remember that it's a gift that the Holy Spirit gives to you. It's not, you know, Pastor Chris said, you know, I said, Leah, stand up, speak in tongues. Okay, you know, you know, I said, you stand up, speak in tongues. I don't give gifts. The Holy Spirit gives the gifts. Some of us do speak in tongues. Some of us don't. We are still the same. When one is not inferior to another. When one is not superior, right? We are still brothers and sisters. We still have the same Lord. We still have the same Spirit. The same Spirit, a variety of gifts, right? So it's so easy to get to this area, but you need to speak in tongues. And we so selectively choose the areas we concentrate on. Why is it about speaking in tongues? When it's always about Jesus. It was always about Jesus. It will always be about Jesus. Not about my speaking in tongues or lack of. When we make it so much about one particular gift. And again, Paul says, I speak in, I speak in tongues more than most of you. 
you know, my prayer time and my time of devotion. And it's important, you know, listen, you know, seek that, desire spiritual gifts, desire to speak in tongues, but do not feel under, don't fall under condemnation. Or if you do speak in tongues, don't act like you're better than others and don't. Be, be level-minded. Be humble. Walk humbly with your God. Remember, it is a grace gift. You cannot force. I can teach you Romanian, but I cannot teach you how to speak in tongues because it's a gift. You, could t you can teach me Tagalog. You can t teach me Tamil or, you know, Spanish or something. You can teach me because you know it, but you cannot teach the gifts of the Holy Spirit because they're gifts. It's something the Holy Spirit gives us. Right? So we need to love each other. We need to respect each other. We need to just not take this air of better than and being superior for the gift I have or not. Some churches say, oh, speaking in tongues, you know, that's, that's the devil. You know, they're just people that are totally afraid. And then you go, of course, the other extreme, you know, we speak in tongues. And when you step in the church, everybody's just speaking in tongues. Like, huh, what is going on? You guys have too much to drink this morning? What's, what's up? So there's no order, there's just, everything is just in the air. And I'm not trying to step on toes, and I'm not trying to make fun. Because again, God is a God of order, and God wants you to have the spiritual gifts. But the spiritual gifts, again, is what? You know, to, it's a grace gift to bless the body of Christ. So there, if there is speaking in tongues, you know, there's a, there should be a spirit of interpret, you know, a gift of interpret, interpreting tongues present. If not, let's just speak in the tongues. We can all understand and communicate, right? And feel edified as a result. Now, I want you to know, and I'm not going to give you, thank God I don't have a video camera in my uh, time of devotion, but I do speak in tongues. I pray. It's a prayer language. You know, I, I seek the Lord for the, for the church, for direction, for all this stuff, because I need the Spirit of God in me. But at no, no time, I hope, I made you feel less than a son or a daughter of God, because I'm better than you. And if that happens... Please bring it to my attention because I need to repent. I should never walk in a way where I'm making you feel less than. And we're talking about speaking in tongues. They come in two forms. There's a personal prayer language, you know, and you're in prayer, you're, you know, devotion. And as a spiritual gift, when it's prophetic and interpreted, you know, you know as interpreted and then becomes prophecy. You know, so it's a personal prayer language or a spiritual gift, you know, that when you speak in tongues, you know, somebody with a gift of interpretation is there and tells everybody as an edification what's going on. The Bible lists at least 25 different gifts. And, you know, of course, all the attention, uh, all the attention is given, to, but do you speak in tongues? It's not about only speaking in tongues. It's about all these gifts that the Holy Spirit graciously gives to the body and wants to build the body up. You know, we shouldn't focus on one gift, tongues. You know, it's like I'm like, sometimes, you know, I'm just like tired. Like, yeah, but pastor, do you speak in tongues? I'm like, yeah, I speak Romanian. Hablo Espanol. Well, yeah, un poquito, sí. Right? <laughs> Dios te bendiga. Vaya con Dios. Tienen buenos días. Hallelujah. Gloria a Dios. Amen. Right? Praise God. We speak in tongues, but there is a place for it. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And He gives them to each one just as Pastor Christi determines. The Bible, of course, according to Pastor Christi. Right? No. He gives them to each one just as he determines right at the same time you shouldn't avoid desire spiritual gifts desire to speak in tongues maybe tonight before going to bed just take a moment and say god you said that you give me some gifts i want all the gifts that you want me I, I, I remove every fear, every apprehension, any misunderstanding. I just want to receive my gifts so I can serve, so I can bless others, and I can live this life for the greater glory of your name. Desire it. Be it tongues, whatever, wisdom, you know, prof, pro, uh, prophecy, whatever the gift, you know, the Holy Spirit will give you. 
you know, and don't, you know, again, people, again, sometimes because of what they witness and experience, if you have a repulsion to it, like, or you're just a fear of it, like, no, it's going to make me look crazy. The Holy Spirit, remember, I, and I share with you the testimony of a sister coming out of a Roman Catholic environment. As she received the gifts of the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues, she said she was so afraid. I was afraid because I thought that it would hurt me. The Holy Spirit, God in that moment told her, I will not give you something that will hurt you. God will not give you something that will hurt you. God is giving us his Holy Spirit, his gifts to enhance your wisdom, to enhance your personality, to enhance your gifts, to make you a more efficient and effective, you know, servant. And remember that God anoints you to complete the work of ministry. God has called you and anointed you to finish your work in your generation, in your time. He has given you his Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, 23 through 25. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? So right to any Sunday morning, as we come to corporately, as we corporately come together, we got to be mindful of the people that are around us. There are people that, you know, they're maybe checking in, you know, just checking it out, see what's going on, what is this all about. There, you know, there are people at all levels of their spiritual journey. We ought to be mindful of each other. Right? And what, what Paul says. So everybody speaks in tongues. And some, you know, some are not understood or some, you know, or some, you know, are some who don't understand what's going on or some unbelievers coming in. Will they not say that you're out of your mind? No, I want every time as a pastor, as people come in this place, they'll get to hear Jesus. They'll get to see Jesus. It is all about Jesus, not about our talking in tongues. Lack of or not. And when we come together, we need to be aware. We need to be tender-hearted. We have those that maybe don't understand. Or outright unbelievers. I love the, the part of the Holy Spirit where he gives us guidelines. He gives us instruction. Paul said, I speak in tongues. But God is more concerned about people coming to Christ than you speaking in tongues. God is more concerned with people coming to Jesus Christ than you speaking in tongues or me speaking in tongues. So let's not make it about that. Because he loves people. And if God loves people and is more concerned about people coming to Jesus Christ, then we should be concerned about what God is concerned, about people coming to know Jesus Christ. And I'll talk in closing about gifts from a friend. Gifts from a friend. And again, I said people are weird. The Holy Spirit is now weird. And what the, these gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us are to help you, not to hurt you. And spiritual gifts are, you know, are not out of date. You know, they're not outdated. In the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. But equally, remind yourself, the 1 Corinthians 13 says, even though I speak in tongues of angels, even though I give my body to be burned, sacrificed, even, 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 even in fill in the blanks, if I love not, I am nothing but a resounding gong. Love, 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 because love is a person, is a person of God, for God so loved, God doesn't have love, God is love. Love is primary. And more than this, if you have gifts without the fruit of the Spirit, you got to check it out. Hey, we should all be fruit inspectors. Because the gifts of the Spirit will produce and ought to produce the fruit of the Spirit. And I need to remind you that there are gifts of, of the Spirit and that is the fruit of the Spirit. It is, so if you have gifts, character should follow. Fruit should follow. Joy, peace, self-control, and everything else should follow. How often times you see, oh, such a gifted person. And I remember a, a pastor once said, that which we accomplish by our gifts, we destroy by our character. Gifts is good, it's good, but character is more important. This is what as a pastor, I'm looking for volunteers and leaders. It's great that you're gifted, but is there some character there? 
And I like what Pastor Bob says, God is much more interested in our character than in our comforts. Because it is character that we take with us in, in, in the presence of God in glory. Gifts from a friend. Do you have someone in your life that you like receiving gift, uh, gifts from? Can I say a, a, a word here? Christmas. Who's a better gift giver, mom or dad? Mom using dad's uh, pocket, right? <laughs> Something like that. I love Christmas. Man, big shout out to my mother-in-law. My father-in-law is having a heart attack right now. She's the best gift giver, hands down. You are too, because you're paying for it. No, but <laughs> you have all some in your, in your life, right? You love receiving gifts. And then you have all, also some in your lives, you receive a present like, oh no, what is it this time? You're afraid to open it. It's like, oh, it's the same thing, the same pair of underwear. Are you kidding me? We all like to receive gifts. You're truly included. And the Holy Spirit gives the good gifts. The Holy Spirit is the good kind of guy. He comes and gives you, again, good gifts, not something to hurt you, but to help you. And first of all, his gifts are unique. His gifts are unique. Don't you love it when you get a unique gift? Look how unique you are, all of us. Look next to you, how unique you are. a gift. You are a present. You are a blessing. You are a gift. And we are all so unique. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God who works all of them in all men. The same God. And you can see different gifts in the families. You know, and um, I found this story, uh, and it's not original to me, you know, preachers, you all preachers, you know, use stories, and we borrow material from each other. So and I came across this story of um, somebody d uh, dropped a des de dessert on the floor at dinner. And here is what each person would say according to their giftedness. So the person dropped the dessert after dinner on the floor. Mercy says, don't feel bad. It could have happened to anybody. If that's you, you got a gift of mercy. Don't feel bad. It could have happened to, every, to anybody. Preaching. That's what happens when you're not careful. If you're like that, like Pastor Christy, passion, you got some preaching going on. Right there. Serving. is Oh, let me help you clean up that. Let me pull it up together with you. You know? Teaching. Well, the reason it, it fell is because it was too heavy on one side. Got a teaching spirit, uh, gift right there. You're motivated to explain it. Exhortation. Next time, let's serve the dessert with a meal. You know? You may have the, uh, the gift of giving. I'll be happy to buy you another dessert. Now some of you, and I think a lot of us, have this, this gift, administration. Jim, would you get the mop? Mary, would you get the broom, please? Somebody, bring the water. Let's, let's all clean together, right? Well, let's put hands up. You got, you got some administration going on? That's why, you know, on the, we have this Alive track. We have our next steps. This class at Christ Alive, you know, that it, it, it's a, a spiritual gift inventory, a personality test, you know, where we, we get to learn who, who God made us to be so we can serve, so we can be effective. And the Holy Spirit has some unique gifts for each and every one of us. So don't avoid it. So for, second of all, you know, his gifts are needed. You need some spiritual gifts. I need them. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now all of you together are Christ's body. And each one of you is a separate and necessary part of it. You are a necessary part of Christ alive. You are a necessary part of the kingdom of God. Of the body of Christ. You belong. You are a part of. You are necessary. Circle this necessary. Even, you know. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, you're necessary? Now, turn to the other person that was least favorite and say, you're necessary too. You are important. You are needed. 
We all fit together, fit together like a jigsaw puzzle, right? Some of us crazy are shaped, you know, and whatnot. You know, let's not get there in the shape, right? So gifts are needed thirdly. His gifts are fulfilling. His gifts are fulfilling. The gifts that you receive, again, they're fulfilling, they're helpful, they're fun. And I believe the happiest people are that discover, they find their spiritual gifts, the life calling. They have found it. John 15, verse 8 and 11. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. If you're a disciple of Jesus, if you're a follower of Christ, you'll bear much fruit. Why? Because you want to honor the Father, right? You want to bring glory to Him. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Real joy does not come from making a lot of money, which money is good. It's good. So, listen, some of you are cold and are very good at making money. Make money because somebody's got to make it. And don't forget why you're making money. You're a missionary. God has placed each and every one of you with influence and places where you can shine forth the glory of God. Not for your own advancement, but there where you are, you'll show, uh, shine forth again, for, you know, shine for Jesus. And use the resources that God has given you to make a difference, support the work of the kingdom. Real joy does not come from having a lot of pleasure. Real joy does not come from things. Real joy comes from knowing my life is productive. I see Pastor Bob so joyful. I kid you not, and I'm not just, you know, pumping him up. He's one of the guys that he lives with a schedule. If he doesn't have a to-do list in a day, he's not happy. It drives me crazy. The moment he wakes you up, he's like, to-do, have my cup of coffee. Stay away from Christy and his kids. You know, read my Bible and all this stuff. You know? I mean, he's got a to-do list from the moment he wakes up. And, and at the end of the day, he feels so good because he's done something. He ran three hours on the treadmill. He exercised. He talked to people. He went to work. He's just, he feels so, so satisfied and so complete. And he's serving and whatever it is. And I know many of you are here as well. You just like being productive. How many of you just like, young people, don't put your hands up. How, uh, okay, let's not go there. All right. We're talking about gifts. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, how many of you young people want your life to make a difference for eternity? You want your life to count, right? You don't want to just be going down in history like, yeah, they were around and they were, they were not. We all want to make sure that our life counts. We want to make sure that our life make a difference for eternity. In closing, I want to ask the musician up. Last point, his gifts, his gifts touch other people's lives. His gifts touch other people's lives. They're gifts that God has given you that he wants to use you to touch other people's lives. You get the gift, but other people benefit from it. You get the gift, but other people benefit from it. It's for others. Our gifts aren't about us, but about people. Because people matter for eternity. The soul of men and women matter for eternity. When you're going to stand before Jesus, he's not going to ask you, but did you speak in tongues? He's going to ask you, did you tell others about me? Did you, what did you do with, with, with the good news? The gifts are not random. They're part of God's master plan to reach the world for him. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. God has given gifts to each of you from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Manage them well so that God's generosity can flow through you. Manage your spiritual gifts well so God's generosity you know, can flow through you. God wants to use you. And actually, as a matter of fact, he is. One day you're going to face God. You're going to have to have answer to two questions. God will say, what did you do with my son Jesus? Second is, what did you do with the gifts I gave you? Remember the parable of the talents in Matthew 25? We're not going to read it. No, I'm just going to bury it there. I'm just going to go to church, show up to church on Sunday morning. Check. 12 o'clock, check. I'm check out. I go. Have you used... The gifts. Are you using the gifts? God wants you to use your gifts. What have you done with your gifts? Only God 
knows what kind of spiritual explosion, what of an awakening can, can burst forth as we all come together, discovering our gifts and we use our gifts for the greater glory of God. I encourage you, find your gift, find your talent, find your calling. And you'll, feel, you'll be full of passion. You'll feel, be full of joy. You'll, you'll be satisfied. Others will too be blessed. Discover your gifts. Be actively serving. You know what? I don't, you know, listen, I, I know we all have struggles, but how many times you maybe came on a, to church on a Sunday morning, maybe to a food pantry to serve, and you yourself are falling apart. You're not feeling well. You actually probably feel like you just should be in the hospital right now. Maybe you've just gotten some bad news, you know, you're dealing through some crisis. But you know what? You got yourself up and you went and you did something for others. And at the end of it, you felt so joyful, so fulfilled, so content. Say, thank you, God, for the opportunity. Christ alive, you're an amazing people. The vast majority of you are investing your lives, are serving, are giving generously. You're, you're active, involved in ministry in various areas. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Using your gift, serving for the greater glory of God. My dream for each and every one of us, that we all find our passion, our gifts, and get busy serving. Because see, when you're busy serving, you don't have time to gossip, you don't have time to criticize, because you're busy serving. You're busy serving. You find purpose. I want to leave you with the definition of a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift is a special supernatural ability. It's not a, you know, just a talent, something innate. But it's a, it's a special supernatural ability that God gives to each of his children. So that together they can advance God's purpose in the world. It is about God's purpose in the world. It's not about Pastor Christie you know, publishing books, writing books, making a name for himself, building a big church and doing things. It's great if that you know, happens or not, but it's not about writing books. And actually, I'm on the edge that I feel that no other book needs to be written. We don't need to write any more books about God, about Jesus, theology. But we need a lot of work to do. We need to roll up our sleeves. Because Jesus, in the night in which he betrayed, he took up a pen and he started to write a letter. He started to write a book. No. What did he do? Roll up his sleeves. He washed his disciples' feet. He served. So what would happen if a servolution would begin from this place to the end of the earth? We all roll up our sleeves. Stop acting super spiritual, super spiritual, you know, soldiers. But roll up, roll up our sleeves and go serving our community with the love of Jesus. I think a great deal of people come to know Jesus, his love, his forgiveness. A spiritual gift is a special supernatural ability that God gives to each of his children so that together they can advance his purpose in this world. Remember what he was said about King David in the book of Acts. He served God's purposes in his generation, and then he fell asleep. We will all fall asleep one day. The question that lies at hand, will you have served God's purpose in your generation, or will you have served the devil's purpose in our generation? Whose purpose are you going to join? Would you stand with me in closing? Please take this message to heart as you go tonight and, you know, maybe before prayer or at any moment, maybe in your car, say, God, uh, I want all you got for me. I want everything. I don't want some, even in the areas where I'm scared, I'm afraid, or I don't understand. He will teach you and lead you in all truth. Holy Spirit, come and teach me. Holy Spirit, come and show me your gifts. Then, you know, give me the gifts you think I should have and so I can serve God's purpose in my generation. Do not be afraid. What God gives is not to harm you, but it's to help you.